Oh, nice. Welcome to class. Thank you for coming. <laughs> How do you get points? The dean's going to ask for you. Yeah, I think so. your <laughs> roster. Hey, uh, what did you do good over spring break? Uh, I just did the All right, so um, last time we were talking about long run growth, <laughs> you guys seemed super enthused about it. I'm guessing because it was right before spring break and I didn't even want to be here. Um, so real briefly, I'll summarize like what we talked about before moving on to the next chapter. So um, basically, um, McCluskey, her theory on long run growth is that um, up until like the 1800s, cultures were hostile to industry. So if you read like you read the Christian Bible, even like Catholic like thinkers of the 1970s, they were pretty hostile towards um, what they called like bourgeois trading or like just like commerce in general, putting a monetary value on stuff. Um, yeah, there was they didn't allow interest to be charged throughout Europe until like the Middle Ages. Um, even much of like the Arab world today, you're not they're not allowed to charge interest for loans, which. Um, Obviously, this is the kind of stuff that hurts growth, that hurts um, trading and stuff. So humans, they lived in poverty, and they life, life rarely improved. And if it did, it didn't last very long. And then they went back you know, into poverty. Um, you could say the wage growth reverted back to the mean. Anytime it, per capita growth went up too high, it'd come back down. Um, then by historical accident in um, the low countries, they lost their uh, clerisy, their upper class, the aristocracy. Um, when they were killed off in the war with Spain, um, the, their countries began to thrive because they accepted um, industry and investment. It was um, the bourgeois, like middle class, the traders who were at that point, I don't know, like the leader society, and they were very open to trade because that's, I mean, that's what they did. This eventually hopped across the English Channel, and that attitude took hold there in England. They became a nation of shopkeepers rather than um, <coughs> just just a bunch of poor people living in villages like they had been before. Um, the Industrial Revolution actually dates to before the Great Enrichment. It was only after they began to honor business in England and innovation, they accepted these things and put a high value on them, that um, growth began to accelerate and then slowly spread. Um, and her theory is less economic and more cultural, but it's easy to discuss these terms in, um, or this idea in economic terms, that there's less of a cost for people to act when culture is more accepting of them acting in that way. So when culture or when a society is um, looks at innovation positively, at people starting businesses and trading positively, there's less of a cost to engage in these actions. If something is considered taboo by society, um, if people will, I don't know, stop talking to you because they think you're a bad person because you do something, you're going to be less likely to do that thing. Um, that's kind of the, the idea behind this. Um, so to put all this together, um, compare her to the past theories, um, she doesn't doubt the impact of other things on wealth, you know, the institutions, geography, um, that kind of stuff. But what she was looking for is actual spark. And trading is very important, but trading can't bring you the growth that we've had in the past 200 years. Um, institutions are hugely important. Uh, think back to the Hobbesian jungle where it's, you know, every man for himself, a bunch of cavemen fighting with each other. Um, compare that to uh, a society like ours with secure property rights, where when you have, when you have your property, other people can't steal from you. Um, you know, if they do, you take them to court and you get, you get made whole for that. Um, a place with secure property rights like that is more con conducive to growth than you know, a place where it's everyone for themselves. <coughs> Capital, like Karl Marx said, obviously improves output and productivity. Um, I can be a much better teacher right now talking with um, like this computer and the projector than um, I can if we were st like standing outside on the mall. Like, and think about that for any business, obviously capital is going to make it more productive. But again, that's not the only thing. It's not the cause because capital has existed for a long time. Ancient China had quite a bit of capital compared to the rest of the ancient world, but they never took off like Europe did. Um, so to think about it, um, 
I like to compare it to the combustion triangle. You know, for like how to start a fire, you need oxygen, you need the, the fuel itself to burn, you need a spark. So um, think of capital as the fuel. It's the thing we use to create products. Um, I'll think of institutions as the oxygen. This is the environment within which growth occurs. Uh, without proper institutions, like for a fire without oxygen, um, we won't have growth. Even if you have um, a lot of capital, if you don't have the proper institutions, things like private property rights, um, a good legal system, you're not gonna see um, the sort of growth that's gonna choke it off. And finally, culture is a spark. Because even with those other two present, um, the ancient Mayans, um, the Chinese, the Ottomans, they all had institutions and capital. Um, without the cultural attitudes that support and honor innovation and business, you're not gonna see the sort of growth that, um, that we've experienced. So um, just to note, I think McCloskey does underweight the, the importance of institutions in her analysis. I think that's just her way to try to sell her theory and differentiate herself from um, people like North and Weingass who um, put all the emphasis on institutions. Um, but largely, I do agree with her theory. And um, real quick, I'll show a quick video I put on uh, Canvas talking about, um, basically she talks about her theory of long run growth. If this thing ever turns on. All right, well, while we're waiting for that, um, I did put up the, the study guide on Canvas. What study guide? Study guide for the next exam. When is that? A week from today. Oh, okay. I thought it was still Yeah, it says it's on Thursday, still up there. Oh, I, have, I put up a new thing on there, a new, like, course schedule. Okay, oh, okay. it just still says on Canvas. Um, so there's not a thing Thursday? No, Thursday I will do uh, a review okay. of that study guide. And so Where did I put it? Oh, it's under, um, exam? what's that? When is the actual exam? Next Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, right here, this is the new class outline. Oh, I tried to open that up, but it wouldn't let me open it up for some reason. Wait, so we have a test. What is this? Huh. Okay, so that's why you guys couldn't see it. That's cool. Yes, Tuesday. Thursday? Okay, yeah, it's not showing. But yeah, I pushed it back one class because we missed like two before. Okay. is that once people were very poor and now they're very rich. In 1800, the average person in the world made $3 a day. I mean, the modern equivalent of $3 a day. So the goods and services, the stuff you could buy in the amount of $3 a day. So three quarters of a cappuccino per day, nothing else. In the last 30 years, the percentage of people who are that badly off in the world has fallen by half. It's been halved. So things are going very well. And for we in places like the United States, where they've gone exceptionally well since 1800, we're making, now hear this, $130 a day. And what a transformation. It's just incredible. Now, we had earned the $3 a day forever. So there was, a, there was in history, if you want a short economic history, since the beginning of time, it was $3 a day going along like this. And then right here, which is 1800, it goes, it goes up like mad. And there's this fantastic transformation of the condition of ordinary folks. Why did it happen? One old explanation is exploitation. You hear this a lot. We are rich because there are a bunch of poor people elsewhere in the world who are poor. That's not true. There's always been exploitation in history. 
and it didn't cause economic growth. So it can't be modern exploitation. Nor can it be, to think of a more conservative way of looking at it, investment. It's not investment. It's not piling bricks on bricks or BAs on BAs. It's new ideas. It's innovation. The fantastic number of changes in machinery and materials and, and organizational ideas, such as the modern university or reinforced concrete, it's just amazing. That caused the this hockey stick, the blade of the hockey stick. Why did this happen? Two changes in Holland and England in the 1600s and 1700s which was a rise of economic liberty and social honor for inventors, merchants, manufacturers. Before these were dishonored occupations, then they became honored. And out of that came a tremendous burst of innovation that had been earlier discouraged because they weren't free and they weren't honored. All right, so do you guys have any questions about um, about the long run growth, the different topics that we talked about last class and then into the beginning of this class? Oh yeah, before I forget. Um, what did you do good over spring break? Um, I went to a basketball game in DC. Oh, nice. Uh, Wizards or college? Yeah. yeah, the Wizards play. It was, it was actually pretty fun. Nice. Never had a chance to go to a Wizards game when I was down there. It's, yeah, it's a pretty nice um, nice venue. It's, yeah. It's right in Chinatown, so it's like kind of a different part of DC. So. Yeah. Yeah, I've been by it a few times, but never like never in there for a game. Have you ever been to a hockey game? There? No. Was I game was game. this close to going to the Stanley Cup Finals. I should have pulled the trigger on it. It was one of my friends in um, grad school was from like Tampa. She was like a huge Tampa Bay fan. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so um, so what do you guys think of her theory? Maybe compared to like the other ones we talked about last time. Do you guys have any? Any opinions or any like doubts on on some of these? Didn't think so, but I thought I'd ask. It's been a long time since we talked about it. So um, now let's move on to externalities. Uh, today I'm going to try using the PowerPoints and um, see if that helps the class. I know you guys. When I asked you for um, I don't know your your thoughts on class so far, you said like more PowerPoints, use PowerPoints. So I'm going to try. Gonna try that today. At least you'll have this to look off of. The less writing I'll have to do. What? You guys want to pay attention? Or? No, I know what's going on. <laughs> okay. So um, a question. Well, let's just skip that. Uh, question this chapter asks is um, it starts talking about pollution. So um, who here would like to reduce pollution all the way down to zero? No pollution in the world. All right, we got a few people. All right. I actually thought there'd be more. Um, so we're talking about entirely stopping all pollution. So do you, do you think zero, zero amount of pollution is optimal for our society? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so imagine if there's one, there's one last piece of trash in the world, just like a gum wrapper floating across the Great Plains. Um, how many teachers, how many firefighters, truck drivers, CEOs, do you think should leave their job, leave their desk immediately, and go there and try to pick it up to find it? I think you should. Let's go <laughs> <laughs> Boom, roasted. All right. Um, yeah, so think of that last piece of trash picking up. It's not that, it's not that valuable. It's more valuable to have those people working, um, doing their other things. Um, this right here is just another, another example, another exercise in marginal analysis. And that next piece of trash isn't worth it because of what you have to give up and the opportunity cost of what you have to give up. Um, like you might have to give up education, Max. I know, I know you wouldn't want that. 
uh, um, well, pollution is an example of externality, which is what we're talking about this chapter. So an externality is a, um, a benefit or a cost. Um, yeah, benefit or cost that affects someone who's not directly involved in the production or consumption of a good or service. So um, an example, pollution is an example that's a negative externality that harms people. Um, I drive a crappy old Chrysler. Um, the pollution doesn't just affect me and the Chrysler Corporation, it also affects you guys. It affects other people that, that don't even know me because it's pumping out you know, toxins in, into the environment. Um, another example, think of somebody you know, talking in class, disrupting their neighbors. It's distracting them, making them worse off. Um, so while the market is great at producing the optimal amount of goods and services, um, in theory, when we talk about um, you know, the uh, individual's cost curve being the same as society's cost curve, and in this case, what they, what they do is for best for themselves is best for society. When there's externalities present, when other people are affected, uh, the free market doesn't allocate resources in the, uh, in the optimal way. It doesn't make it perfect, it actually complicates things. So um, can you guys give some examples, some, some other examples of externalities? Yeah, there's pollution. There's um, another oh, an example they give a lot is uh, utilities and their their pollution. Any, any ideas of a positive externality? Something you might do that makes people actually better off and you don't capture all the benefits of? Well, you, you don't get paid for volunteer work, and it does make you feel better off. So I guess that could be that could be considered it. Um, how about being vaccinated? Not only does it make you better off, but it makes you know other people in society better off because you're not giving them measles. Education is another one. Living in a more educated society makes people better off. Um, Another example one of my professors used to give is he used to have this like this really, I don't know, some classic car thing like a Mustang convertible from like the 60s. He said it was a real awesome car. People really enjoyed it when he drive it by because it looked so cool. And he said he should have been paid for, um, for their enjoyment. It's like a quarter person tossed it his way. I could say my piece of junk Chrysler is a negative externality and people have to look at that. Someone hit it when I was in Arlington and like dented the door but I haven't bothered to get it fixed because it's not worth the money. Things falling apart, it runs real loud. Wow, sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> All right, so what are the effects, uh, skip electricity, what are the effects of externalities? Externalities interfere with economic efficiency of the market because other people are affected and it's not um, taken into account by the people engaging in the transactions their concerns, the costs put on them or the benefits that they gain aren't considered by um, those two parties. So a competitive market, it maximizes producer and consumer surplus, but this is only when it's absent externalities. When it's present, when they are present, it's not the case. Because externality causes the private and the social costs to differ. So a private cost, that's borne by the producer of a good or service. So, so if I'm buying something, it's me and the person I'm buying it from. Um, the social cost is the total cost of producing a good or service. So this is the private and the externality that's created. So it's the cost of my car to me, plus the cost of you guys dealing with the pollution. Um, it also causes, externalities cause difference between the private and the social benefits. Obviously the private benefit is what, what you get from buying the product. Social benefit is what everyone gets from you buying the product. Even other people dealing with the externalities. Okay, so now for negative externality, the producer bears most of but not all the cost of productions for negative externality. Others bear the cost of the externality because it's not felt by the producer, it's not being taken into account when they're deciding you know, how much to produce and how much to sell. 
Um, so example, obviously, one they always give is pollution. Um, utilities don't bear the full cost of pollution. Obviously, that's spread out to everyone from a depleted ozone or more CO2 in the environment, whatever. Um, because of that, because everyone bears a cost, not just them, they don't take it into account. They're not being charged for it. Like, no, one's, no one's telling the utility to pay them to, uh, to reduce their, their emissions or you know, to, to compensate them for the emissions. So they're not gonna pay it. They don't take it into account. So if you look at supply and demand, oops. Okay, right here we have supply and demand chart for um, economic efficiency. Uh, the effect of the actionality on economic efficiency. So now S right here, this lower supply curve is the marginal private cost curve. The second supply curve is the marginal social cost curve. And the difference between these two is the cost of, they get acid rain, the cost of like pollution in general from the um, utility company. Now, if you notice here, if you can see from this, from this chart, the quantity demanded in a totally free market is right here, quantity of electricity. Where this supply curve, the marginal social cost curve crosses the demand curve that's the efficient quantity. That's what if. If the utilities bore the full cost of the pollution, they would only produce this much. And they would do it at a higher price. Because this efficient price takes into account the cost of pollution, whereas the market cost doesn't take into account the pollution. Um, so if you think about the cost of acid rain, so it's the damages that the actual acid rain causes. Maybe it messes up your car or it you have to replace the shingles on your roof more often. Um, the difficulties from dealing with smog, if you're like, you know, like you're in LA and you're trying to commute and everything's like uh, completely covered in haze. Maybe it's a loss of wildlife for like, I don't know, fishing lands or hunting lands. Maybe it's uglier sunsets. All these different things that make your life worse than it would be without the pollution. Um, so what we see here, like I said, is you see an overproduction of electricity. Instead of being down here, where it should be, it's over there. There's a greater quality produced. Because these firms, the utilities don't face the full cost. Um, in an efficient market that they do, um, or they don't, in the free market, they don't face what they would in an efficient market, where they bear the cost of the externality. Um, so this triangle right here, this is the dead weight loss. That's the amount of value that's lost in society because we're in this suboptimal world where we're producing too much electricity. Um, so society moving from here to here gets rid of that dead weight loss. It moves us back to the optimal, uh, the optimal allocation of electricity. Uh, it's very similar to what we did last section with uh, taxes. <coughs> how how um, taxes, I guess if you move from here to here, would cause a, a dead weight loss. Um, same basic thing as we move in this direction, it's not to get rid of the dead weight loss. So yeah, so you can have positive externalities and negative externalities. Positive externalities, like college education, make people better off. So by you being, by having more um, human capital, you're more educated. Maybe you're better at voting. You vote for, because you're more informed or more willing to be informed, you can vote for better politicians. Maybe you're creating new products that um, people really benefit from. Uh, I think we can say we're all better off because Steve Jobs made made iPhones and work to invent them. Um, in this case, well, oh, oh wait, we're not there yet. Um, so uh, positive externalities are less commonly thought of. Um, when, when you mention externalities, you, your mind instantly goes to negative ones, usually pollution. But um, but yeah, so um, 
these positive externalities, they also reduce economic efficiency because you're not doing as much as you should. The demand curve, which normally, um, normally represents the, the value that the individual who like purchases the good or service derives from it. In this case, they don't get all that value from it. <coughs> so it, demand curve is, their demand curve is lower than society's demand curve. Um, yeah, up until now, we've assumed that demand curve captures the entire benefit. But in this case, when there's externalities, it's wrong. So now, college education, the, the typical example we use. Um, in this case, the demand curve of the private benefit is down here, but society's benefit is up here. Individuals aren't capturing all of the benefit that society gets, so they're going to um, under-consume resources, um, or education resources. In an efficient market, the quantity demand is going to be up here, where, um, where the social benefit, where that demand curve crosses the supply curve, but in, in a market where they don't capture the externalities, it's down here, where the, uh, the private demand curve crosses the supply curve. In an um, optimal, like in the efficient outcome, when individuals, if they would capture the externality, the price would be higher and the um, quantity demand would be higher. Um, and you see this dead weight loss um, that occurs at the market, at the market level, the price and quantity, it disappears when you move up to the um, social, the social demand curve. Um, yeah, so if people took the external benefits into account, if they were somehow able to capture that, they would, they would, the demand curve would move from the private demand curve from D1 out to the social demand curve D2. And that's how you reduce um, debt weight loss, move to the um, optimal allocation. Um, so this, these both are examples of market failures that we talked about before, uh, the situation where the optimal quality, or excuse me, quantity of products is not produced. Um, it's caused by both externalities, positive and negative externalities. Um, a situation where you have this kind of dead weight loss. Um, Okay, so externalities, they um, often exist because of a lack of private property rights. So um, property rights are the rights of individuals or firms to the exclusive use of their property. It's including the right to buy it or sell it. They can, um, they can transfer it to any individual they want. They can use it as they see fit. Um, and property can either be physical or intangible. So it can either be an actual like product you own or a thing you own. It could be like you know your house. It could be a laptop. It could be um, also an idea. So you know like patents and copyrights. Uh, you created a new idea. You can make that your own property. So if someone wants to use it, they have to pay you for it, or else um, they they can't use it. Um, so now. That brings us to a private solution to externalities. Um, we'll talk about the Coase theorem. It's a way to um, privately bargain between individuals when there's an externality to get rid of that externality. Um, and uh, it was Coase and Ar Armin Alchin who did a lot of work back in the 60s on um, how private property rights relate to externalities and how um, when property rights are incomplete, when someone doesn't own something, um, it's impossible to like to compensate them automatically. Like the legal system can't handle that, so um, that's a big driver of you know a cause of these externalities occurring. Um, so, to give a, a brief example of cosy and bargaining, imagine a frat house that loves to throw parties on the weekends, right next door to a family house in town. Um, 
Yeah, so they're throwing parties on the weekends. Obviously, the family, they've got kids next door. They don't want to be kept up all night by the parties. They get annoyed by the music, by the, um, uh, by the trashy beer cans being thrown out. So one solution is, you know, just call the cops to fight over it. But another solution is they can actually get together and um, try to bargain over, over the partying on the weekends. So say maybe the fraternity pays them some money to like clean up their yard or to you know, compensate them for keeping them up. Or maybe the family gives the fraternity some money to, um, to cool down their partying, to do it on different nights or to end earlier, make their music um, not as loud. Um, in this way, if they get together, they can, they can bargain like that and actually come to an agreement. So the externality of their noise, the fraternity party's noise, keep them up all night, um, the trash, that kind of stuff, they can get rid of that or at least compensate them for that. Um, yeah, so if you buy a house, you have the exclusive right to use that house. You can refuse to let people in. That's your property. Um, unless like the cops show up with a warrant. But in that case, make sure you ask them to show you the warrant. Don't just take their word for it. Um, before you let them in. So, um, and another example, intangible property, college education. Um, was it, yeah, so you get, you get, you get the benefit from, um, education. Um, unless you're like Connor who didn't show up today or like, um, Lily and Jenna talking, like you get the benefit from this education. Um, so let's, Let's define the Coase theorem. There's um, private parties can solve the externalities by bargaining with, bargaining with each other, like the fraternity and the uh, family next door. Uh, back in 1960, Ronald Coase um, wrote the most cited paper since World War II. It was in the journal of Law and Economics. Um, it's a really good journal. They will let me publish in there when I submitted stuff, so that's, you know, that's how high quality they have. Um, and he won the Nobel Prize for this idea, and he built, built upon it um, throughout his career. So we talked about um, eliminating pollution earlier. We said it's not efficient um, to remove that last piece of wrapper from the Great Plains. Uh, while it would be beneficial, the opportunity cost, what we'd have to give up, is, um, is much more than the benefit of that slightly cleaner world. Um, so think of cleaning your room. Would you clean up every single piece of dust in your room? Is that worth it? to eradicate everything? Yeah. Yeah. Really? You got nothing else going on that would be more valuable than getting that last piece of dust? If your room is clean, you sleep the same. I like to keep my room clean, but not, not spotless. I, I, there's much better things I can do with my time than clean up that last piece of dust. Um, so using this type of thinking, let's look at what, um, what Coase tells us. So in a world with uh, well-defined property rights and low transaction costs, people can bargain to reduce externalities. Basically, no matter who gets the property rights originally, um, whether it's um, I don't know, the people in general getting the right to clean air or if it's the um, utility having the right to pollute, um, efficient outcomes are reached. They'll bargain with each other and they'll, they'll come to the best, um, know, the best deal for both of them. Um, and people will haggle until the one party is compensated for the cost that they're forced to bear. Um, yeah, so they gave, he gave an example in the paper of a paper mill and a farmer. So if the farmer had property rights over the stream, if like he owned a stream and the mill was polluting it, um, the externality problem would be resolved. The, the mill could pay him to um, whatever the, the cost of cleaning up that stream was. Um, if they agreed to that, then, then they could go, they could pollute when, um, as they produce, I don't know, they produce that paper and, um, and he can have his clean, clean stream. Um, but if the paper mill owes, owns the stream, you could reach the same exact conclusion. Um, or, or you could reach the opposite where the, um, where the farmer pays them to not pollute. At the end of the day, you still get um, 
you still end up with a stream that's not polluted. Um, so one of the problems with this is the assumptions. The assumptions that property rights are assigned and enforceable and transaction costs are low. Transaction costs are the uh, time and resources that are spent to reach a transaction for an exchange for a good or service. Uh, when these are high, it makes coaxing bargaining very difficult. Um, so go back to the frat house example. Say the neighbors hate the guys in the frat next door. They have uh, a lot of animosity towards them, so they don't want to meet them to negotiate. Um, think they, they have different schedules of families like at work during the day while the fraternities they hang out all day but then they're they're doing their stuff at night that they don't want to have to miss out on um dealing with guys in fraternity is like hurting cats it's almost impossible to get them to do anything if you get them all in the same room you can't get more than half of them to be serious at a, at a time these all make make uh, negotiating very difficult very costly um, in this case, they're unlikely to reach a deal. Um, if there's many people in the transaction, so think back to pollution, like everyone's affected by pollution. How do you get everyone together to be able to talk to, to sit down at a table and negotiate? Um, it makes it very difficult or even impossible to negotiate. Also, property rights are not always clear. Who owns the air? Who owns the water? Who owns fish in the ocean? There's no clear property rights here. And because of that, it makes this very difficult. Um, Alchin said the lack of property rights causes externalities to exist in most of the cases. If someone damages your property, you have legal recourse. If I went over and I smashed Max's laptop right now, he could sue me and force me to replace it. Um, if there's no property rights over something, it's very difficult to have legal recourse to, to fix it. If someone damages it, they can't make you whole because you know it's not yours. Um, so now, if you're on a plane and someone puts their uh, seat too far back and sticking into your knees and it's annoying the hell out of you, you think you would try to bargain with them, try to pay them to put, move their seat up? No. Why not? It's awkward, isn't it? According to Coase, and um, this Josh Barrow guy, it's, it's the efficient thing to do. If you're being annoyed, you, it's worth it for you to pay them to, um, you know, to, to stop annoying you. Or they could pay you to annoy you. I think for like, you know, for 20, 20 bucks for like an hour of flight, I would take someone's seat back on my knees. Um, it is weird, though, um, trying to pay people for things like this or talking about it. Most people would look at you like you're crazy, even though it's the efficient thing to do. Okay, so um, the key insights from Coast is when there are no transaction costs, the efficient outcome will be reached and property rights don't matter. It doesn't matter who gets them first, um, you'll reach the right outcome. In a world of transaction costs, he tells us that the initial assignment of property rights does matter. That whoever gets a property rights first um, tends to end up with it. And um, public policy, it's smart to focus on the second case because we don't live in a low transaction cost world most times. Um, if it's just like two farmers butted up against each other, one has like cattle, one's growing crops, uh, neither wants to pay to put up the fence, but the cattle keeps going, like trampling the crops. They can, they can come together, they can negotiate, it's pretty easy, it's just two people. But if you're dealing with utilities, and like putting out pollution for a ton of people, it's gonna be very difficult to um, reach an agreement. Um, so both, but it's important to remember that both markets and government action have transaction costs. Um, so you have to compare the two of them and select the one with the lower cost. Um, now government policies are, is the next section. So, um, well, before we get there, do you guys have any questions about coasts or about externalities in general? Um, all right, I've been talking for a while. Let's take a break.
and um, get a question from each side of the room. <clears throat> Give our friends a break for a second. So uh, this side, do you guys got anything? It doesn't have to be all eaten out, I mean literally anything. I mean, I was thinking about this, like, would an example of an externality be like, because I know whenever they were, uh, like, putting in the road and building the Alton curve and everything, when they put the highway in there, they were, like, approaching families that lived in the homes there about uh, taking, like, a settlement to find a different home because they were going to, uh, like, just put the highway there over their home. Would that be, like, an example of that? Or, um. When they pay that's kind of through. solving the externality. I guess so. Yeah. The externality would be dealing with the construction, those people dealing with the construction and the noise from the highway. Well, they're, they're, they're like the highway was going to be put right over where the oh, house is. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's why they need to get them out of there. Yeah, so I don't know if that might be an example of that. I don't know if that's exactly an externality. I think that's like a response. I was just thinking about it. How about you guys? Um, <laughs> Scrangle is a great time. Um, I don't know, parades are great when you um, when you pregame them. They're really boring when you just like stand there like your parents and just watch people walk by. Yeah. But well, when you wake up and you get to celebrate beforehand, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Unfortunately, I, I have a, a green blazer I wear for like St. Patrick's Day stuff. Lost the gold button off of it, so. But I can't wear it to Pittsburgh this weekend. You were in school. How many times did you go to IU Patties? I never went to IU Patties. Why? Uh, what weekend is IU Patties? State Patties used to be amazing. I went there my freshman year before they like banned and shut everything down. I watched this girl get dragged in college. I mean. <laughs> I've seen a guy jump off of a roof at IU Patties. Like, <laughs> just like trust falls off of a roof and they call There's like three people that die every year from doing that. Was it last year or two years ago? Yeah, it happens every year. I know, but somebody like. Okay, that's not the kind of party he's trying to go to. They're like, really? Usually it's at least. So, that sounds like Bloomsburg, like their block party. I Every year, like someone gets shot, someone gets tear gassed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just gonna, I just looked to describe the parade as just like thousands of people publicly drinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some fights. Some guy. We're like walking down the street. I'm going back to the hotel to try to get something to eat. Some guy literally. Someone's standing there. He walks up and goes, boom, punches him right in the face, and then runs away. And like 10 <laughs> cops just like chase this guy for like a mile. <laughs> I cannot believe that happened. Did he anything or just no, no, wasn't even looking at him. Just standing like this. The guy just wanted to punch someone, I guess. Sounds like his own castle. Okay, let's get back to uh, government policies way more exciting than uh, St. Patrick's Day celebrations, right? So, um, so we talked about before how excise taxes can distort economic decision making um, and they can move the level of production away from the efficient level. But externalities, they do the same exact thing. You know, show the graphs, they work in a similar way. Um, so here we have an opportunity. If you can tax at the same level and in the opposite direction of the externality, you can cancel it out, so to speak, and you can move it back to the efficient level. Um, so 100 years ago, AC Pagu um, developed, well, basically developed this idea of, of this sort of taxation to move you back to the efficient level. Um, so here we see a graph of, of how to explain it. So going back to utilities example, if you place a tax on utilities um, equal to the externality that um, is created by their pollution, you can move um, production back to the efficient level. Um, take this marginal, marginal private cost, 
move it up to the marginal social cost by putting tax equal to the difference between the two. That decreases the quantity from what's provided in the market when they're not taking into account the externality. That to the quantity um, that's efficient, that is taking into account the externality. Um, and obviously, this is going to increase the price paid for the good as well. Um, So um, this curve right here, um, the private cost, that's the price received by producers. Um, obviously where, where the supply curve crosses the demand curve, that's where you're going to get the price paid by consumers. Remember, because of the tax, there's going to be a difference there. They're going to, the uh, producers are going to pay the tax, um, which reduces, obviously, the amount of money they're going to get for the product. Obviously, um, this area right here was a dead weight loss before. That's going to be reduced down to zero by moving this back to the um, to the social cost. Uh, now, with positive externalities, the government can exact or can enact the exact opposite policy. Um, so instead of taxing production, what they do is um, pay a subsidy to consumers to uh, increase their demand to solve the problem of. Um, of too low demand. Um, so an example is for college students, they can pay them a subsidy, which is what government does. They give grants to individuals. They offer um, state universities, um, you know, like IUP and Penn State, offer them below cost. And it's uh, then funded by taxpayer money. Um, that way to encourage more people to go to college or people to go on and get um, get graduate degrees because they don't have that much debt from undergrad. Uh, to bring in line the individual's demand and the demand society has. Um, so basically, what you get here is increasing the demand curve, moving it from, from the private demand curve up, into the, up to the social demand curve. Um, the difference between the two lines is going to be uh, the amount of the subsidy that's paid to the, the students. Uh, in this case, both price and quantity increase. Um, anyone who's, who's seen the price of college over the past couple decades can understand why, why more people demanding college is going to increase the cost of college. Um, so it shouldn't be surprising in this um, Increase the price of the side effects of uh, the government policy. Um, so, uh, economists they really prefer corrective taxes because it results in a more efficient outcome by you know fixing the externality. Um, because of um, Pigou, they're called Pigouian taxes and subsidies. Um, he was one who first demonstrated. Um, the ability to use use these taxes and subsidies to solve the problem of externalities. Um, yeah, and that also gives us a, um, I guess, a good reminder that if you discover something new, name it after yourself, and then people will talk about you hundreds of years later. But can anyone find a problem with um, taxes and subsidies in the real world about trying to enact these these Pugumi taxes and subsidies? Think uh, moving away from the chalkboard and into actual like real life like application of these ideas. Uh, do you guys know what the demand curve for these products are? Um, it's a uh, it's what Friedrich Hayek called the knowledge problem. Um, 
if you don't know the true value of the externality, if you're not sure the market demand curve is, I don't know, $6 per person above what the private demand curve is, you don't know how much, uh, you know, how much of a tax to put in place or how much of a subsidy to put in place. Um, so you could, a lot of times, the politicians are just guessing when they put in a tax in place, when they put in you know, a tax on cigarettes, for instance. Um, they can actually make things less efficient. If they overshoot it or undershoot it, they could go too far. And um, you know, if they put too, too high of a tax on there, decrease demand too, yeah, decrease demand too much. Um, and of increasing um, the dead weight loss, but in the opposite direction. Um, and biases might cause policymakers to overestimate the cost. Um, after like 60 years, everyone's saying smoking's bad, smoking's terrible, like there's insanely high taxes on there. Maybe this is caused by a uh, anti-smoking bias by politicians. Maybe it's not the most um, efficient way or the efficient amount to use. Again, I don't know. I don't know what the socially optimal amount of um, smoking is. Um, and finally, biases might, no, I said that already. So um, the political process, even Pagu himself doubted this. He said, it's not sufficient to contrast the imperfect adjustments of unfettered private enterprise with the best adjustments that economists in their studies can imagine. We cannot expect that any state authority will attain or even wholeheartedly seek that ideal. State authorities are liable alike to ignorance, to sectional pressure, and to personal corruption by private interests. A loud voice part of their constituents, if organized for votes, may easily outweigh the whole. So he notes, there are problem with, problems with government policymaking um, that may cause these taxes and subsidies to, um, to not be the proper amount. Um, so it's imperfect, just like the market in this case is imperfect. So we need to you know, figure out which one is more imperfect, which one is worse, and then go with the opposite. Um, so um, this is an example of, or fail, like ignoring this, an example of the Nirvana fallacy. So if you assume the government policy is no cost, that they're gonna be perfect, they know exactly um, society's demand curve, and they, they can put the perfect tax on there and move it up there, but you assume the market process has all these problems. Yeah, it's called the Nirvana fallacy, assuming one's better than the other. Or likewise, assuming that the market is perfect and saying, no, whatever, um, whatever the market leads to, we gotta roll with that because that's, that's the best way to go. That's what the market decided. And then assuming the government is only gonna mess things up. You gotta look at what, what both of them really do, um, how well both of them function, and pick the better one. So now this brings us to this question about um, taxing cigarettes. Um, obviously, the consumption of cigarettes uh, causes externalities. Um, so we impose sin taxes on these goods to, um, to reduce their consumption. Um, things like cigarettes, um, some places are taxing soda, alcohol, they're taxed to try to reduce their consumption. Um, cigarettes in particular have huge excise taxes. And um, if you look at the demand for cigarettes over the past like 40, 50 years, demand is a lot lower than it used to be. Like it's really helped work to reduce demand. So smokers obviously bear the cost of their consumption. Not only do they pay for cigarettes, but they pay with um, you know, their own health problems as time goes on, but they don't bear all the costs. Obviously there's secondhand smoke and there's um, healthcare costs, which is a big one. Because if they're on Medicare or Medicaid, um, obviously taxpayers are paying for that. And um, even if they're on private insurance, um, like through their employer, the other employees there end up having to pay more for their health insurance. Um, you know, to offset that. But um, at the same time, smokers also die earlier because of their health problems. Um, so a lot of the healthcare costs come later in people's lives. The last few years, they tend to spend more money than, um, than their younger days when they're healthier. Um, also, they'll pay into Medicaid and Social Security, excuse me, Medicare and Social Security, but receive fewer benefits because again, they're dying earlier. Um, an economist, Skip Fiscusi, he um, studied this and said that the effects offset each other like completely. That the increased costs and like more healthcare um, that's required for them because there are more health problems 
are offset by the fact that they die earlier and consume fewer healthcare services, uh, fewer government programs later on in life. Um, there may be other costs uh, like secondhand smoke, um, and other things that smoking like you know bothers people. It makes them worse off. Uh, cigarette butts being littered all over the place is at least some sort of a cost. But um, yeah, he found just for the uh, for the, like the healthcare costs, they offset each other, which is kind of surprising. And um, the textbook asks questions like, oh, maybe is this tax level appropriate because it offsets each other? Um, when it comes to secondhand smoke, do any of you guys remember um, smoking sections in restaurants? Okay, I was afraid that I was going to be like the only one that remembered that. But I remember being a kid and going there, they had the own, their own special section like, like sectioned off in the place. And you never wanted to get sat like right next to it because it was basically like sitting in the smoking section. But nowadays it's like hard to imagine someone like smoking like indoors in a restaurant or like any kind of business. Okay, so um, we'll talk one more um, government um, alternative policy to um, the Bogovian taxes and then we'll get out of here. Uh, this one is, uh, it's called command and control. That's a policy where the government imposes uh, quantitative limits on an externality. Um, so they could like limit a firm to say you're only allowed to put out you know, this much pollution, or they could require specific remedies. So putting like scrubbers on the smokestacks or I don't know, using different type of coal, things like that. Um, an example is back in the 1980s, the federal government required um, like GM and Ford to put uh, catalytic converters in their cars to reduce uh, some sort of emission. Um, up until that, like they weren't required and like cars tended not to have, at least American-made cars, didn't tend to have catalytic converters. Um, problem is these solutions aren't efficient. Not all producers have the same cost to reduce their externalities. Some might be already producing um, so it's like some utilities could be producing very little um, pollution. They could be using like cleaner burning coal, um, I don't know, using like new plants that put out less, less pollution, while some older places might be using like dirty coal, might be like super inefficient. So obviously some find it easier to reduce than others. Um, yeah, so, So this brought us to um, cap and trade, which was a potential, which was a solution that Congress did, I think, back in the 90s. So they capped the total emissions that utilities were allowed to put out. Um, I don't know, they, they picked a certain level and said, you guys can do this much. And then everyone had a percentage of that based on like how much electricity they produced. And then they could go and they could trade those the pollution allowances. So this encouraged a more efficient uh, reduction in pollution. These were like, they're sold on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, like other um, boards and future contracts. Um, so basically, if you, were, if you were like a new place that burned with clean coal and you couldn't like reduce at all, you could buy, um, yeah, you could buy the allowances if you, I don't know, needed more to be able to produce. Or if you were like so efficient that you were below the level, you could sell off your extra ones to um, to producers that were that were less efficient, that produced more pollution. Um, yeah, this ended up being a much lower cost than just a command and control telling everyone to re reduce their emissions by a certain amount. Um, it only cost eight hundred seventy million dollars for firms to meet Congress's goal of like the the level of emissions, um, and a command and control estimate or the candy control um, policy was estimated to have cost like $7.4 billion. So this is, this is like six and a half billion dollars in savings by using this, it's still regulation, but it's more of a market. Um, so command and control, this, these types of policies tend to struggle because um, Regulators tend to have a lack of knowledge. They don't know individually how each different place, how much they can reduce their emissions by, um, you know, how much it'll cost for them to reduce their emissions. I don't know how much people in that area need electricity. These sorts of things that only like those producers know or only certain people 
at those like utilities know. Um, and plus, obviously, there's dangers in the political process. Um, there were there was pressure by environmental groups to get rid of the program because they said it was like a license to pollute, and they didn't want any pollution to occur. But at the same time, you know, people still need electricity. Um, so it was important to to be able to pollute a little bit to to produce this electricity. Um, Yeah, so um, so we'll end here today. Um, for next class, we're going to finish up the chapter on the four categories of goods, a little bit on property rights, and then we'll review the, um, go over the study guide. Um, I would suggest doing it like ahead of time, like trying to do it like today or tomorrow, and then we can more go over it in class. I, that's, at least for me, that's a better way to learn, a uh, better way to study.